Last time we talked about how mutation, recombination, reassortment drives the production of diversity in viruses. Today we're going to explore how that diversity leads to the emergence of new viruses. So today's topic is emerging viruses. We define this as the causative agent of a new or previously unrecognized infection. So these need not be new viruses that we haven't seen before, but maybe it's causing something we don't know before. And that's a term, emerging infection or emerging virus uh, became popular in the 1990s, but emerging viruses are not new. They have emerged throughout the history of the Earth. We just haven't noticed them. But like any other buzzword, it gets popular, and now it's all over the place. In fact, in more recent history, since humans started clustering together in cities around 11,000 years ago, uh, when we began to develop agriculture and animal husbandry that could support cities, that's when viruses started entering humans uh, in a big way, most likely, and a lot of the viruses we have today are remnants of that crossover. So a little more uh, on definitions of emerging viruses. So an emerging virus could have an expanded host range with a disease not previously obvious, and it can involve transmission from a wild or domesticated animal to humans. And this we call a zoonosis, all right? A zoonotic infection is one that goes from animals to humans. And in fact, most of the emerging viruses that we see today are emergence from animal reservoirs. The wild animals on the planet are very numerous and they each have many, many viruses in them. And as you will see, as we encounter them more frequently, we get some of their viruses. But they have way more viruses that, than which show up in people. So the, the encounters that lead to emerging viruses are probably many, but few of them end up being successful. So sometimes this cross-species infection, another way of saying a zoonosis, can establish a new virus in the population. So SIV, simian immunodeficiency virus, went from chimps to humans around 1920. We'll talk about that in detail next time. And it remained in humans. It is now a human virus. HIV at one time was a new zoonotic infection, but it is no longer. It's considered a human virus because it has established a reservoir in people and it passes from person to person. Other times when you have a zoonotic infection, chains of infection in humans are not sustained and you get dead ends. So Ebola and Marburg viruses we think go from bats to humans and eventually those infections fizzle out. You'll see when we talk about Ebola today, Ebola infections don't go on for decades. We are able to stop them, and this is because they don't establish reservoirs in the human population. And whenever there's a new outbreak of Ebola, for example, uh, there, this represents a new crossover from animals into people. And that's the case for many zoonotic infections. They're not sustainable in people. You have to always go back to the original reservoir. Now here's an interesting pie chart that was, was put together a while ago in which individuals attempted to look at all the viruses that are around today that infect humans and then ask when, roughly when do we think these entered the human population? And so there are four classes here, they're color coded, the top in blue, these are adapted pathogens, all right? So these came from an animal into Homo sapiens at some point in the history of Homo sapiens and as I said before, mostly in the last 11,000 years, and they became adapted and they are with us today. So HIV is an example of that. Measles virus, polio virus, all of the well-known human infections all have origins in animal viruses uh, and uh, those are the adapted pathogens. And then we have, and there are 32 of those, so viruses belonging to a number of genera. So there are viruses belonging to 32 genera that fit this bill, they are adapted pathogens. Uh, there are viruses of 37 genera which are zoonotic pathogens. That means every time there's an outbreak, the virus goes from an animal to a person. There's a little outbreak, then it goes away, 
and then you start again. That's what zoonosis means, there's repeated infections from animals to humans. These are not human viruses, they can infect humans, but they don't become human viruses because they don't become established uh, in the human population. Uh, then we have members of 16 genera, which are heirloom pathogens, and the code here is less than Homo sapiens. Now what that means is, you know, there are ancestors to the hominid species. Homo sapiens, Homo neanderthalensis, and so forth. There were very old ancestors of all sorts of primates before there were Homo species. And we think these viruses we got from those species. So the, the moment or the time when Homo sapiens arose, we acquired these uh, viruses from the other species, which were presumably still uh, in the environment. Members of uh, 16 genera fit that, less than homo species. And then uh, the green uh, heirloom pathogens. So heirloom means exactly what it sounds like. We've inherited these from ancestors. The greater than homo simply means that we have acquired these from other homo species besides homo sapiens. All right, not a lot of those, but there are some. And so there are only six of those. And we can tell sort of that this is the case by looking at the sequences and estimating the age of these viruses and so forth. So you can see we get viruses from animals and we got them from our ancestors before. And so this is the story. Every virus that's in us uh, has come eventually from an animal or uh, in the case of Homo, closely related species. Of course, now there's just Homo sapiens on Earth. And so there's no other species, related species for us to acquire viruses from. Now, needless to say, the press is obsessed with emerging viruses. This is a cover of Newsweek on the left after an Ebola outbreak of a number of years ago. In the old days, you used to make newspapers and you'd pass it on a newsstand and see a headline of Ebola and you'd buy it. Nowadays, it's all about clicks. Whatever gets clicks on a web page, sensationalism, uh, killing war, theft, uh, all kinds of, all the bad things that people do, <laughs> the news loves to, follow it, and they love viruses that kill people. They just love the idea that a virus will spread over the earth and kill everyone. They're always making headlines on a daily basis. Is this virus gonna do this or that? So it started way back with Fever, the book published in the 1960s, which was the description of the first emerging infection that we really understood, the emergence of Lassa virus from a rodent reservoir in Nigeria. And all of a sudden, nurses started getting sick and dying, and there was this outbreak, and no one could figure out what was going on. We didn't, we didn't think in those days that viruses came from animals. We think, well, well, there are viruses that infect people, and we've always had them, and, and that's the end of the story. So we're much more sophisticated today. But that began it all. And this is a great book, by the way, and I've told you before that I read this, and that's what made me uh, want to become a virologist. But today, if you look if you just do Zika search on Google, you'll find all the headlines telling you what exactly Zika is going to do tomorrow, next week, and next year. Now, to what I want to explore today is why do viruses cross from animals into people? The answer is really straightforward, and the fact that we didn't figure this out before 1960 is a bit embarrassing. But there are lots of things that humans do on the planet that give us contact with new pathogens or move the pathogens around the planet. And some of them are listed here. Obviously, air travel and the shrinking, what we call the globalization of the planet. Now, you can be anywhere in 24 hours. Your food can come from all over the planet and so forth. So uh, diseases, viruses, bacteria, all sorts of microbes are easy to spread. We alter ecosystems all the time. We cut down forests. It started with the Panama Canal. We decided to cut a canal through uh, Panama to facilitate ships going from uh, ocean to ocean. And of course, that was a forest, a tropical forest there filled with animals with their own viruses. And guess what? We got yellow fever as a consequence. And, and we, so, but we, we ripped everything down and we're doing the same thing today. Environmental changes of all sorts you know, building dams and shipping tires around, doing what we will with the planet, deforestation, huge cities. I think in part the reason why Zika has gone crazy in Brazil is that there's such a high density of population in parts of that country uh, and, the, and the virus is moving through it rapidly. And of course, we learned last time that uh, microbes evolve readily at every replication cycle. They produce mutants. And a quasi-species is made, and that gives you opportunity if you find yourself in a new place. If suddenly a virus from the Amazon is in New York City, 
maybe the right mutant is in that population to be able to replicate in New Yorkers. But the overriding factor really is population growth. At one point, you know, there wasn't any travel on this planet. We had uh, you, the west, the eastern hemisphere, Europe, uh, Africa and Asia, and that was pretty much separated from the Western Hemisphere. Nobody traveled back and forth until a certain time. And the viruses on one continent were different from the viruses on another. And then they traveled. They went from one place to another. But with population growth, we've filled just about every corner of the planet. Look at this incredible uh, population graph. This is numbers, billions of humans on the planet for so many thousands of years was pretty much the same, and then all of a sudden, uh, in the last 500 years ago, it shot up. And this certainly, these are new hosts for viruses. And so we're going to encounter new viruses, and that's why they infect us more, than, more and more. So the basic message today is, in many parts of the world, there are still extensive forests with an indigenous animal population. And each of those animals, no matter what they are, have their own viruses. The plants, of course, have them. They don't seem to jump into us very often, but insects of all sorts and rodents all the way up to larger animals. So this is just a, an image of the Amazon north region of Brazil. And this image was made a number of years ago. And people go in here and they, they sample animals for viruses. And at the time, they found 183 uh, viruses of vertebrates, some of which are carried by arthropods like mosquitoes. All right? And each of these little boxes has names of many viruses in it. So these were all uh, brand new. So if you go into the Amazon, which people are doing now and cutting it down, those are people going in there. They could be infected and bring back the infections to uh, wherever they go. And this is just one part of the world. Africa is full of areas like this that are still forests with lots of animals and their viruses. So those are the sources of new infections. And pretty soon there'll be no place on Earth where humans don't occupy. And maybe they'll wipe out all the forests and most of these animals will be gone. But until then, the crossover is likely. So here's a list of a number of what we call emerging viruses that have, we've discovered them in the last years or so. Uh, on the left is the virus name. Middle column, you have the family. Many of these uh, may be recognizable to you. And on the right is what we think have been the major drivers of the emergence of these viruses. Uh, so for example, dengue virus, urban population density combined with the breeding of mosquitoes. You know, we have transported mosquitoes around the world by the used tire trade. You cover boats with used tires, to, and countries like to recycle them, but in the time it takes for them to go across the oceans, it rains and they fill with water and mosquitoes are growing in them. In 80s, albopictus has spread over m many parts of the world this way. In fact, it entered Houston. It was never in the U.S. before a certain year. It entered Houston in used tire shipping lanes. Uh, Bushmeat consumption is another uh, very important uh, factor for contacting new viruses in many parts of the world. As I've said before, you can't go into a supermarket and buy whatever meat you want. You have to go out and get it yourself. And so uh, catching monkeys of all sorts is endangering you because they may have their own viruses. So e Ebola viruses are thought to enter humans by the bushmeat trade. You can see agriculture, bats, is another factor we'll talk about. Here's bushmeat trade again. Pig bird agriculture is a big deal in transmitting new influenza viruses, rodents of various sorts. Uh, agriculture building dams causes mosquito habitats to be amplified. Uh, and even the weather can make a difference. And what I want to do today is go over a couple examples of these sorts of scenarios where a certain condition has led to the emergence of a new virus that we never saw before. Now, of course, don't forget what we learned last time. Evolution has a big role to play in this. Remember, the biodiversity of viruses is huge because of the quasi-species, because of error-prone replication. So every virus stock is a mixture of many, many different genotypes. And again, when introduced into a new host, one of those might be just the right one that can then replicate. Uh, and so we have quasi-species and then adaptation to new hosts in, in environments by selection. So here is a picture of uh, four general ways that viruses interact with hosts. And we have here, we're going to go through each of these, and I'll give you some examples of them. We have a stable virus-host relationship. 
and shown in the green box there. So that was like polio virus or measles virus in humans. The virus has been well adapted to growth in humans and passes uh, efficiently from human to human. Uh, and the virus is maintained in the ecosystem. An evolving uh, host virus interaction uh, is something that happens when a virus first passes to a naive population and it spreads through it rapidly and perhaps variants are selected quickly on before the system becomes a stable one. Uh, dead end is a one-way trip. The virus goes into a host, it replicates, but doesn't get much further. Now, we, we think of Ebola virus as one of these, and I'll explain that to you in a moment. And finally, we have resistant hosts, where the virus gets in, but nothing happens. The, vir the host isn't suitable for the virus, the virus doesn't replicate, and is quickly cleared. And the arrows all indicate the way viruses can travel between these different ones. So depending, so if a stable interaction occurs in an animal in a forest, that virus could then get into a human. It could, it could get into a human and not go anywhere. It would be resistant situation. It could get into a human and then evolve slowly, or it could get into a human and be a dead end. So you can have uh, viruses moving between many of these, as you can see here. Let's look at a stable uh, host virus interaction first. Again, this is when the virus has been in the host for a number of years. Both participants multiply. The virus multiplies. The host is not wiped out, obviously. And some of these are permanent. So for example, humans are the only no hosts that we know of for measles virus, herpes simplex virus, uh, cytomegalovirus, smallpox, and of course, polioviruses, is the only known host. That's why we can eradicate uh, potentially these viruses. The, uh, the idea of stable doesn't mean that there's, more than, there's only one species of host involved. It can be more than one. Influenza A viruses have stable uh, interactions with human hosts, but also with other animals as well. So the same with flaviviruses. West Nile has a stable interaction with a human host, but it also has bird reservoirs and mosquitoes transmit the virus back and forth. So it can be more than one species. Evolving host virus relationship. The hallmarks are instability and unpredictability. This is where we have a virus going from a stable relationship into a brand new one that's never been encountered before. Uh, and so sometime, sometimes the virus takes and will replicate in that species, but the initial years are full of uh, instability as the virus and the host both change. And this, these kinds of infections can be benign, they can be lethal as well. Some examples are, include the introduction of viruses, again, by old world colonists. Smallpox and measles were present in the old world for thousands of years, and then as explorers moved across the oceans to the Americas, they brought these with them, and they were introduced to a brand new naive population. They spread th quickly through the populations, wiped out many people, and of course it probably took many years for that to sta stabilize and have hosts that were more resistant to infection and viruses that evolved to be less lethal. West Nile introduction into the US in 1999 is another example. And this actually underscores the point that an emerging infection doesn't have to be a brand new virus that we've never seen. It might be just the introduction of a virus that's been elsewhere into a new environment. So West Nile had been found in Africa in the 40s and it was multiplying throughout Africa and Asia. It was never in the Western Hemisphere. It came to New York in 1999 and then spread dramatically across the country. In that process, it underwent a lot of uh, mutation and different genotypes ended up emer emerging after replication uh, in the US. But it's a nice example of how introduction of a virus leads to an evolving relationship. And of course, the introduction of rabbits into Australia, which we talked about last time, the hunting rabbits, they multiplied to large numbers. So the Australians decided to release a virus to kill them. First year killed most of them, but a few survived. The second year, uh, the virus uh, evolved to be less lethal and the rabbits evolved to be more resistant. That's an evolving host virus relationship. So it often happens when the virus first goes into the population. But you could imagine that if a population changes in some way, the viruses that infect it could also evolve. Now here's a dead end interaction, which probably happens a lot. Now here in New York City, probably not so much, although we do have a lot of travel of people coming from overseas. And I suspect, you know, if they're coming from countries with large animal populations with their viruses 
uh, that a lot of humans come in the country and deliver viruses here, but they never get anywhere. They probably infect a few people and reach dead end uh, interactions. So that's a frequent outcome of cross-species infections. Ebola virus is an example. Uh, we think the, the reservoir in Africa for Ebola virus is bats. There may be other animals as well. Even the bat conclusion is a little bit tenuous. Talk about that later. And we think humans, chimps, and gorillas are infected and are dead end hosts for the most part. Now you can get obviously spread of Ebola from human to human. Well, we can stop that really easily if we follow quarantine procedures and, and, and do a number of things which we'll talk about in a moment. So it's effectively a dead end interaction because the virus never gets established in people or in chimps or in gorillas. We think it just wipes them out uh, and it never gets established in the population. Now, uh, in many cases, um, the infection is not transmitted effectively. So for Ebola, it really depends where you are. Now in Africa, if you have an outbreak of Ebola, you get a lot of transmission because people are not used to uh, d uh, procedures that would limit infection. We'll talk about more of that later. Here in the US, Ebola came to the US and we managed to contain it because we know how to put people in containment facilities and not spread infections. So the same thing with avian influenza, H5N1. This periodically jumps from birds into people. It's a lethal infection that doesn't transmit from person to person, even parts of the world where isolation isn't a practice. So these dead end infections in the, in the big scheme of things don't really contribute to the spread of a natural infection. Now, the last outbreak of Ebola was something like 28,000 cases, the biggest by far, and there were a number of reasons for that. But uh, this is not something that is going to infect most of the world. The virus isn't simply uh, adapted enough to people. So let's look at a couple of life cycles that reflect some of these principles uh, we have talked about. And here is a, a life cycle of an arbovirus, a virus that's tra transmitted by arthropods, mosquitoes or ticks or other kinds of insects. And um, here on the top here, we have a stable host virus interaction, which involves uh, mosquitoes cycling the virus among bird hosts. So these are wild birds. The mosquito uh, bites a bird to take a blood meal, delivers virus to the bird, the bird becomes viremic. Uh, and then another mosquito will pick it up and spread it to other birds as well. So that is the stable host virus relationship with, which occurs somewhere in the forest. And you can see that uh, if, in fact, someone is raising chickens nearby, the chickens can be infected when the mosquitoes bite them as well. Now, uh, other mosquito species could bite the same birds and transmit the virus to other hosts as well. So that's a stable virus-host interaction. When these mosquitoes, which carry viruses, infect either humans or horses, they can be infected, but they are dead-end hosts. They do not spread the infection to others, either by contact or respiratory transmission or uh, by mosquitoes biting them. Not enough, there's not enough viremia in these individuals so that if a, if a, vi a mosquito takes a blood meal, it's likely to transmit the virus to another. So these are dead-end interactions. And you typically see very, very small outbreaks of viral diseases spread this way, which all involve a number of mosquitoes that have the virus biting many people and you get an outbreak, but it never spreads uh, among the people. So that's what a dead end host is. Ticks can also spread virus infections and that's illustrated on this slide. Same principle, we have a stable host virus interaction. For example, tick-borne encephalitis is a flavivirus which exists in a rodent reservoir. And by the way, often the natural cycles of these viruses, whether it be birds in the previous slide or rodents here, the animals are fine. They don't get sick from virus infection, likely because they have co-evolved with the virus for many, many years. So here the ticks will spread uh, virus among rodents. And again, when other hosts get infected, it could be a goat on a farm or a human, you have a dead end infection. The virus will replicate in the, in the mammal, but it won't spread to others. A tick is not gonna pick up uh, the virus from this host and be able to spread to others. We simply don't see that happening. And again, the assumption is it's a very low frequency event and the viremia is too low to permit it. In the case of the goat, humans can also acquire infection via goat, goat milk because the goat milk um, can have virus particles in it as well. Now here's a, a phylogenetic tree 
of different Flavy viruses that happen to be human pathogens. And what I want to point out here is the amplifying host or the reservoir in nature uh, and the vector. So here we have, uh, these are divided into groups according to the host and the vector. So on the top we have West Nile virus, uh, Japanese and St. Louis encephalitis virus. Uh, and in these, the reservoir host is a bird. So these viruses exist in a natural cycle between birds and the vector, which is coelacine mosquitoes. Uh, but as we have seen in the US, uh, West Nile can also be, and in other parts of the world, West Nile can also be transmitted uh, to humans. But the main cycle is mosquito, bird, mosquito, and humans are incidental infections. Then we have uh, the dengue viruses, Zika, Spondwaini, and yellow fever viruses, where the amplifying host is a primate. And a primate could be a monkey or a human, depending on the virus. So we have four serotypes of dengue, uh, and most of these are spread from human to human by mosquitoes, but in certain parts of the world, there's a thought that there's a sylvatic uh, vac reservoir for dengue in the forest, uh, and that goes from, say, an, a monkey of some sort to another monkey uh, by mosquitoes. And we'll talk about uh, Zika virus, which, again, seems to have in Africa a primate host has now spread to humans and the, and the mosquitoes can carry the virus from humans to humans. And finally, tick-borne encephalitis where the reservoir is rodents and it's spread among rodents uh, by ticks. So there are two broad steps in, in establishing an emerging infection. Obviously the first part is that the virus has to be introduced into a new host. It's existing somewhere in a natural stable cycle, but then it has to go to another host, and there are many ways that that can happen. And then it has to be established and spread. And we'll talk about some examples of viruses uh, that have done this. How do you encounter uh, a new host? Or if you're a host, how do you encounter a new virus? Well, you know, again, most of the viruses that are going to come into people, the new ones that we haven't seen before, are probably existing in animals uh, around the world, uh, and these are chance encounters. Now, which is not to say, again, that you know, here in New York, we're not going to encounter uh, exotic animals, well, depending on your view of things, right? Um, but they're not going to be, there's no monkeys in, in New York City. Uh, they're, they're, they're probably bats. There are certainly raccoons, and those could bring in strange viruses. But mostly, you're going to see viruses being brought into New York because it's a port of entry in the US, and those could certainly spark outbreaks, but those would be encountered by a person in another country. Uh, and so, you know, these rare chance encounters happen all the time, most likely. People bring viruses in all the time, they never go anywhere. You travel, uh, many of you like to go to exotic places, uh, you could encounter viruses and nothing happens. And that's, they may not be transmitted for any number of reasons. Maybe you don't get enough virus. Maybe the right mutant isn't present. Maybe your immune system is great and you've just countered infection. I'm sure this happens an awful lot of times. Now here on the bottom are two examples of, of how to get a new encounter. Uh, we know that, again, SIV came from chimps into humans in the 1920s through the process of hunting animals for bushmeat. This process still goes on today, so the opportunity still exists for viruses to go from monkeys of different kinds, which are eaten all over the world, into humans. On the right, an arthropod. You could be somewhere and never encounter uh, a mammal or a primate of any sort, but there are mosquitoes around, and they've been in the woods feeding on viremic animals. They could bite you as well. So no matter where you are, if there's an animal population that could sustain a diversity of viruses, uh, this could happen. And there are other examples of this as well that could involve eating foods of various sorts, person-to-person -person contacts, uh, and so forth. Now, if, when these viruses encounter you, of course, it need, they need to have susceptible and permissive cells. So, you know, if a mosquito bites you and delivers a virus to your skin, maybe the human skin isn't a good host for the virus and that's the end of it. So the cells may not be susceptible or permissive. Population density are probably important factors. You know, if the density is low, what's the chance of a virus moving out of the woods into a new population. The story of SIV is very illustrative in this respect, and we'll talk about that uh, next week. Now, uh, you have to, in the end, get a serial infection in order for a new virus to spread in humans. So it has to be successful in that first host, and then it has to be able to find a second host, and then spread and spread through the population. Now, if you are a lone hunter in the woods, 
and you're bitten by a mosquito and you're infected, if you never see anyone for the next month uh, the, and either the, the infection is cleared or you die, the, the infection won't go anywhere. And there are many parts of the world where those conditions exist. And we'll, in fact, we'll see next week on how certain conditions overcame the, the lonely hunter uh, to spread HIV uh, throughout Africa. So you can see this is a low probability event. And we think that chance encounters of new viruses and hosts happen all the time, and most of them go nowhere. And we see maybe one a year or every other year that emerges that scares everyone. But there could be many, many more, but most of them fail for any number of reasons. I want to just emphasize again that we have many ways of ensuring that we're going to contact new viruses. You know, we can travel all over the place. We have large cities. Daycare centers where we put lots of people together increase the chances that any one infected individual uh, can be infected. Millions of used tires, for example. Um, making dams which allow mosquitoes to, uh, to breed, irrigation, deforestation. You know, all of these things uh, can be factors in directing humans to new viruses. And then, of course, blood transfusions. If we don't know there's a virus in the blood, we transmit it. In fact, there have already been examples of people acquiring Zika infection via blood transfusions because we didn't know of it last year and the virus was already circulating in the blood supply. Xenotransplantation, transplanting animal organs into people. So, you know, you can get a heart valve from a pig and someday you'll get a, a, a brand new heart from a pig. But you know, pigs have endogenous retroviruses in them, in, integrated in the genome. Who knows what would happen if that is transplanted into a human? And drug abuse and sex and all that spreads viruses much more uh, than it did before. So let's look at some examples of introducing uh, viruses into new populations. And one that we know of historically are the diseases of exploration and colonization. And these illustrate, as I've already said, what happens when you put a brand new virus in a naive population. And this can happen back then. It can still happen today. West Nile came to New York. The, the U.S. was a naive population. We'd never seen West Nile virus before. It's really remarkable, and that wasn't too long ago, 1999. So as I said, smallpox reached Europe from the Far East in about 710 AD. We think it originated from a gerbil to human jump, uh, and then it, it, it spread epidemically all throughout Europe. It was quite a lethal disease, and this led to people in Asia as well, to people actually inoculating themselves with the pustules to try and prevent infection, although we didn't know it was a virus. Uh, and then it was brought to the New World by the colonists. Uh, it killed three and a half million Aztecs in two years. It spread from Hispaniola in 1520, and this is one of the main factors that allowed Cortez, who had, what, 150 men in his army to, to conquer this huge uh, aspect, Aztec civilization. There are other factors as well, of course, but this was a big one. The, the, the men came in and many of them were asymptomatically infected and they spread the virus. And I think some of them even probably spread it knowingly. There are stories of them giving contaminated blankets uh, to the Aztecs as well. But again, a completely naive population and you're introducing a lot of virus into it and it's already a human virus, right? You don't have to go undergo any adaptation. Here's an example of how changes in human behavior can affect the way a virus is spread. So polio, uh, uh, poliomyelitis, the disease caused by polio virus, has been around for a long time. We have an Egyptian carving from 3000 BC that depicts someone with a leg, a wilted uh, atrophied muscle lay in the leg that looks like it's caused by polio. And there are historical accounts of one case of polio here and there for many thousands of years. But at the beginning of the 20th century, all of a sudden it became epidemic. There were outbreaks. We'd never had outbreaks of poliovirus before. Uh, and what happened was we changed our sanitation. So here is, here is a graph showing the annual cases of polio with year starting in the late 1800s. And you can see just after the turn of the century, big outbreaks. And this continues throughout the 50s until we get uh, vaccines online. Um, and what happened? Well, uh, we, got, we learned to do sanitation. We learned not to throw our sewage into the streets or on the ground. 
and walk on it and so forth and have kids play in it. But we made sewers and toilets and so forth. And so we effectively delayed infection with the virus till later in childhood. When you were a kid in the 1800s and before, you were likely to be infected with polio at a very young age, perhaps in your first year of life, because everything was contaminated with fecal material. And at that age, you still had some antibodies from your mother, passively transferred antibodies, so they protected you from infection. But now, in the, starting in the 1900s, we make sewers and toilets, and you're no longer infected as a baby. You're no longer infected maybe till you're five or 10 years old. And then groups of susceptible kids accumulate in cities. The virus comes in, and boom, there's epidemics of polio. That's why it changed from a sporadic disease to an epidemic disease, because of the onset of sanitation. Now, bats are a big source of zoonotic infections. Many people are interested in why this is. Uh, people have done many uh, metagenomic studies of bats, and they are loaded with all kinds of viruses, no matter where in the world you sample them. And the one weird or unanswered un uh, question is why can bats have so many viruses in them and still be okay? They're mostly healthy, with a few exceptions. That's a flying fox or a fruit bat. It's about this big, really impressive, I saw a bunch of them hanging from a tree uh, in Australia a couple years ago, and it was really amazing. If you hang around till about dusk, around 6 p.m., they all take off at once to go looking for fruit. It's like these tiny vampires. They're moving their wings. Man, really, really cool stuff. Uh, anyway, um, we think part of the reason is in order to fly, they, they fly a lot. They, they generate a lot of uh, oxidation. Uh, oxidative radicals, and their immune system has to be able to, to handle that, and we think that's, that makes them tolerate viruses as well. Uh, anyway, the, uh, many new paramyxoviruses have been isolated from these flying foxes, including Nipah and Hendra viruses. And you will, you will hear about Nipah and Hendra viruses soon, I, I guarantee it. Uh, these cause disease in domestic animals, and specifically horses and pigs, and they infect humans. So, so Nipah and Hendra were brand new viruses. They're paramyxoviruses, just like measles virus, uh, that were to brand new discovered from outbreaks uh, in um, uh, Australia and Malaysia. So the first is the outbreak of Nipah virus, first outbreak in 1998. There was an outbreak of respiratory and neurological disease on a pig farm. And of course, in any farming environment, humans are taking care of the animals. So in this case, the virus spread from pigs to the handlers, there were 105 human deaths. It was clear it was coming from the pigs. And so they killed a million pigs, which are used for food, of course. And the way they killed them is very, very sad. But of course, it had to be done. They just dug big trenches and pushed the pigs into it and covered them over. You can find videos of these uh, on YouTube. What happened here was this virus came from a fruit bat and infected the pigs. So the fruit bats excrete the virus in their urine. They're OK, as I've said a few times. Uh, the pig farmers, they're raising pigs, and they plant mango trees, uh, which they can then use to feed the pigs. But it turns out that the bats like mango trees as well. So they come at night, and they eat the mangoes, and they defecate and urinate, and they get virus on the mangoes. And then the pigs, pigs eat them and get infected, and then uh, they, inf they spread the infection to humans. Uh, so we, we got control of this, but outbreaks continue in many areas where the bats uh, and are present. And it turned out some outbreaks in India and Bangladesh were spread by date palm sap. So many people in these areas collect the sap from palm trees. So there's a little uh, bucket there and, a, and a, uh, a device stuck into the tree and the sap drips out. And at night, the bats come. They like the sap too. And they urinate in the sap. And you don't know it. And you drink it. And you're getting a, a, um, a Nipah virus. And when they figured this out, all they had to do is cover the, the vats, and that, that out ends the outbreak. And these, these infections continue as well. Another interesting one, which, and again, it illustrates, so you don't have to be in a, in a forest, but if you're close to one, that's what happened with the Nipah virus. Here's an outbreak of another paramyxovirus, Hendra virus, first in Australia, September 1994. 14 racehorses died. And of course, racehorses have trainers to take care of them. And uh, one of the trainers died. And what happened here, uh, the flying foxes were living in the forest, but 
the people who built these racehorse stables built them too close to the forest so at night the flying foxes would come and you know try and get into the the horses feed they would urinate and contaminate the feed with virus and then the horses would get infected uh, and then the humans as well and so this is a suburb of a city in australia so not far from a forest but you don't have to be in the amazon for example for cross species infections to occur but the 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 situation here of course is that we build uh, our convenience is too close to forests where in this case the bats are living Here's an example uh, from the US of a newly in emerged infection where the climate played a role. And this is a disease called hantavirus pulmonary syndrome, first noted in 1993, some outbreaks of very severe respiratory disease, unlike anything that had been seen before, in the Four Corners area of, of New Mexico, where these four states come together. That's called the Four Corners area. And, um, the disease turned out to be called by a virus that was called C. nombre virus, which is in the deer mouse. Uh, it's a mouse that's actually throughout the US, Paramiscus maniculatus. And if you just sample even here, uh, these mice, deer mice, you will get about 30% of them carrying this virus. So, you know, when you're out in the woods and there are mice around, you shouldn't just catch them and play with them because they could have viruses that are going to infect you. In fact, there have been a number of uh, infections with this virus up in the Adirondacks, people go camping in these uh, wooden structures that, that you could put your, your uh, tent on, and the mice live in there, and these people are getting infected from the mice. Uh, interesting um, little bit of history. This virus was originally called Muerto Canyon virus because that's, that was the name of the location where the virus was first isolated at the Four Corners. Uh, but the people who lived there said, no, we don't want a virus named after our town and they objected to the CDC and they called it Sin Nombre, which is a little bit of a joke, right? No name virus, Sin Nombre. Okay, so what's going on here? In 1992, there was a lot of rainfall, more so than in other years. So one of the things they grow in this area are pinon nuts, which people like to eat and mice like to eat it as well. So the mouse population rose, the mice live in people's homes, so there are more mice living under the floorboards. They excrete the virus in feces and urine. Uh, when it dries up, it becomes aerosolized. So you can see here. So you see, if next time you see some mouse feces on the floor, don't just sweep them up. Put some bleach on them and inactivate any virus, because if you sweep them, you could aerosolize it and inhale uh, the virus. And so that's what happened in these individuals. And it had never been seen before. But when we look back on the medical records in these regions, we could see cases back to 1959. We just hadn't noticed that it was a new disease and we weren't able to uh, diagnose it. This is pretty rare. I think there's something like th a total of three or 400 cases in the US throughout most of the states. Here we go. This is the number of cases um, as of April 2014 from those original ones. Uh, 639 in 34 states, and you can see the darker ones have the more cases. And this virus is found not only in deer mice, but in the white-footed mouse, the rice rat, and the cotton rat. And again, if I show, here's a map actually of Paramiscus maniculatus. You can't see it, but the blue shows you that the mouse uh, is present mostly throughout the U.S. So again, don't play with the wild mice. You probably wouldn't anyway, but in case you have some propensity to do so, uh, you should not. Another interesting virus emerging in the US, Heartland virus disease. And I'm gonna point this out because this is not, again, an Amazon forest. This is right here, this can happen here. S things are here and we just don't notice them or conditions emerge that make us notice them. In 2012, a new virus was identified in two farmers in Missouri. They had a disease consisting of uh, thrombocytopenia and high fever. Um, there were six subsequent cases identified. All of these people were farmers who spent most of the time outdoors, and they always got lots of tick bites every day. So we think the tick is the vector for this virus, although no one's gotten vir infectious virus from the ticks yet. After the first two cases, you know, the CDC got called in, and they identified this new virus. And then they said, oh, there are these other six cases with high fever and thrombocytopedia and some other signs. So they looked with the right nucleic acid probes and they found it. So the, the moral here is once you identify a new virus, you can then go back and look at other cases that you couldn't figure out and it turns out that the virus 
has been around. And this virus has probably been around for ages and we just didn't recognize it as a unique illness. Usually what happens in these cases, I think in these two uh, farmers, they went into a, a university hospital or even a local hospital with a smart infectious disease physician who said there's something unusual here and they send the samples to the CDC and then CDC will look at them because they're not going to CDC doesn't say to every hospital in the country, give me all of your unknown samples. It's up to you to pursue it and to bug CDC until you get, in this case, they sequenced the blood of these farmers and they found uh, this new virus. Okay, so let's uh, talk for the rest of the time about two major outbreaks uh, of the last decade or so and talk about the factors that have promoted the outbreaks and what, what the diseases are like. This is Ebola uh, hemorrhagic fever. And Ebola virus, so there's a family now called the phylovirus family, named so because the particles look thread-like, contains Ebola viruses and Marburg virus. So Marburg virus was actually first seen uh, in 1976 in a primate colony in Germany. There was a laboratory where they were importing uh, monkeys to do research, and some of the workers in that facility got very sick with a hemorrhagic fever, bleeding and fever, and it turned out a brand new virus, Marburg virus. In 1976, also uh, the a, a outbreak of another hemorrhagic fever, uh, this time in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Uh, and this was an outbreak of 318 cases in the DRC with an 88% case fatality rate. Case fatality rate means uh, the number of deaths over the number of laboratory confirmed infections, okay? Uh, that's a very specific number. And then there was an outbreak in the same year in the Sudan, 284 cases, 53% case fatality ratio. The index case in the Sudan outbreak was were cotton factory workers. Uh, we don't know where they got the infection from, but the infection was spread by the use of contaminated needles, which is very common in these areas because they can't afford plastic disposable needles, so the hospitals and clinics use glass needles that are not really autoclave properly. And also family members, you come home from the factory, you're sick, you spread the infection to the family. And this virus was called Ebola virus. Uh, it's named after a small river in the northwest of the DRC shown by that red dot. If you go and zoom in, you will see the Ebola river. In this case, nobody objected to having this virus named after them. Over the years, there have been many outbreaks of Ebola virus disease, uh, mainly in Africa. So here we have the original outbreaks in 1976. Uh, there were a couple of outbreaks in the, in the ensuing years, and the size of the circle in this graph is proportional to the number of cases. There was a long period where we saw no outbreaks, and then in the 90s they began again you can see DRC, a number in the DRC, Uganda, actually other countries here as well, which are not labeled, but the biggest ones are labeled Uganda, but they're all in Africa, DRC. And then of course, uh, the, the one which began a couple of years ago, ended up with 28,646 cases and 39.5% case fatality rate. So that was the biggest outbreak uh, to date. And this is now over and uh, there'll be another one because again, this is a zoonotic infection that is constantly reintroduced from animals into people. I was given the opportunity to put on a BSL-4 suit a couple years ago at uh, the Needle, which is a BSL-4 laboratory in Boston. It's about to open up uh, this year. They have been involved in a big controversy with the neighborhood. It's, it's in Boston. It's uh, right by Boston University. And of course the residents don't want Ebola and Lassa and all these viruses in their neighborhood. They're scared. And so we actually went in and filmed a documentary. It's called Threading the Needle. Okay. Needle is a National Emerging Infectious Diseases Laboratory. That's what it stands for. And you should check it out because we go inside and we show how really safe this place is. And we, we made it in part to try and uh, assure the residents of the city that it would be okay. It's taken like 10 years for them to approve this facility, but it's amazing. Everything is redundant in this facility. They have spare parts for everything. The electricity is redundant. The air, I mean, it is, it's basically a concrete cube within a building. It's just designed for amazing protection. And here you work on BSL-4 viruses, which 
cause high mortality, they spread from person to person, and for which there's no ex uh, approved vaccine or antiviral. So here you have to work on e Ebola virus infections. And you get this suit, which is sealed and taped up. You wear boots because um, the uh, floor, you're, you could actually walk around in the suit, but it would ruin the bottom and the floor is very hard. And then you pump air into it to breathe and it inflates you. You feel like a, a donut man. And then you, when you sit, you have to learn how to do this, you know, sitting down. When I sat down the first time, the, the chair went shooting out from behind me. Uh, and then as you move around the room, there are different hoses hung from the ceiling and you detach and you move to the next one and you attach it. You get really used to doing this. But, you know, when you do experiments, you always have to have someone with you because if you pass out, they have to get you out of the facility. It would take too long for someone to get in. Uh, it's a procedure to get in. And there are all kinds of rules you have to schedule. You have to have everything you need. You know, when I do an experiment, ah, oh, crap, I forgot that. I have to go back and get it. You can't do that in a BSL-4. You have to make sure you have everything. Uh, anyway, it's a very cool experience. So Ebola viruses are these filamentous particles in the EM on the upper left. Uh, the schematic is on the right. Nobody had ever seen anything like this among animal viruses. They're negative stranded RNA, quite a long genome, uh, something like 19 uh, KB or so, and it encodes uh, a number of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven or so proteins, each on its own uh, mRNA, very much like the strategy of VSV in terms of mRNA production. Uh, and this is a very, very lethal virus. And so this is a classic zoonotic infection. The index case is typically someone who has had contact with an animal carcass, bushmeat trade. Again, people hunting meat in the forest for food, they get contaminated. Now, we can't always identify the uh, index case, so we don't know how all of them spread. All those cases I showed you on the graph, we don't know how each one spread, but enough of them have been initiated by bushmeat trade that we think that's the case for all of them. It's transmitted to other humans by close contact with infected fluids and the chains of infection are typically short. The R0 is two, so an infected person typically infects just two other people, so it's not terribly infectious. But again, when you are treated in a hospital and the hospital staff is not aware of the disease, it's easy to spread infection to the hospital, you spread it to your family, and so forth. We'll see that uh, in a moment. Marburg virus, the first phylovirus discovered has been isolated from a cave-dwelling fruit bat, and so that may be the source of that. Somehow it gets into monkeys, and those monkeys then are eaten by humans. Ebola virus, only RNA and antibodies have been found in three different species of bats. Nobody has ever found infectious virus. People say, well, you know, the antibody could just be a cross-reacting antibody from infection with a related virus. So the, the evidence for Ebola virus in bats is slim. Nevertheless, you, you can find lots of journal article, journal, journalistic articles saying that bats are the source. Um, it could very well be that there are other animals out there as well. I always complain about the lack of data. and People tell me, you know, when you want to get these bats, you basically have to suit up and go into a bat cave and sample, and it's really hard to do, and it's expensive. We think that humans, gorillas, and chimps are dead-end hosts. In fact, there's good evidence that gorillas are being wiped out in parts of Africa by infection with Ebola viruses. So here's a schematic of how we think the transmission occurs. The hypothesis is that bats are the natural reservoir. They pass it among each other. They don't seem to be harmed by the virus at all. And then occasionally, uh, they introduce it into other animals, including chimps and gorillas, maybe other animals that we don't know about, and humans as well. Humans could be infected by bats. People do catch bats and eat them, so that could start an infection. Or uh, it's hard to catch a gorilla, but chimps can be caught, and rodents if they're infected as well. So it's a classic zoonotic infection. So here are two examples of outbreaks, the one in Gabon in 1996, 37 cases. A chimp found dead in the forest was eaten by people hunting for food. Uh, 18 people who were involved in butchering the animal became ill. 10 other cases occurred in their family members. They bring the meat home. Hey, look what I got. And they get Ebola as well. So that's another thing you shouldn't do, okay? Don't eat bush meat. If you go somewhere, you could find it. Even chimp bush meat is supposed to be illegal. But you can always find it, they say, and please don't do it. You can add that to all the other things I tell you not to do. Um, Gabon, 1996, uh, 60 cases. A hunter lived in a forest camp. A dead chimp was found in the forest at the time. So not good. We don't have any evidence that he actually ate it, but it was close by, and he could have encountered it in some way. So those are just two examples of that. 
Here is the beginning of the latest outbreak in Western Africa. It started in Guinea and eventually spread to Liberia and Sierra Leone. So there's the beginning in Guecadu. And this, I, I can't really see this very well, um, but basically it, it is a way that you do case tracing to find out where the virus has been. So here we have the index case. A child two years of age developed fever, uh, black stool, and vomiting. He was dead in four days. His entire family got sick. Of course, they're taking care of him, right? They're not bringing him to a hospital. Uh, this includes the village midwife, who then infected another family, and uh, the, the hospital. Some of these people went to the hospital, the hospital workers, and their families. So you see chains of transmission over and over and over again. And so by March of 2014, this has been going on for three months. Nobody had a clue what it was. These countries had never seen Ebola before, so they didn't have to deal with it. Three months before we said, ah, this is Ebola. And in that time, it spread uh, uncontrollably, and that's why we had 28,000 cases. And it took a lot of work to contain it. We had to build Ebola containment centers. We had to teach people. You couldn't treat the sick people at home. They had to go in the containment center. When people died, people like to bury their dead. They go through a ritual, and that gets a lot of people infected. We had to teach them not to do that. Lots of, besides medicine, education. And eventually, we quelled the outbreak without any vaccines or antivirals. So it just shows that this is not a great virus for transmitting. If you can stop the chains of transmission, uh, you can stop the outbreaks. It's spread by contact close contact with infected blood or body fluids uh, or contaminated objects like needles and syringes. It's not really transmitted by aerosol unless you are a doc and you're doing, say, an intubation on an Ebola patient and they, they uh, expectorate right in your face with big droplets that would normally fall to the ground. Then you, you will get infected, but that's not aerosol transmission. We're not talking about these droplets that go a long ways. Uh, you can be infected within a feet or two or three by these large droplets, but it, it's not an aerosolized infection. Uh, the virus can enter mucosal surfaces, breaks in the skin. It can get in via needles, obviously. And the virus is in a lot of fluids, skin, body fluids, nasal secretions, blood, and semen. So lots of opportunities for transmission. The incubation period is 2 to 21 days, during which time you are not contagious. Early symptoms, fever, headache, muscle pain, diarrhea, vomiting. And the, at the peak illness, you have rash, hemorrhage, convulsions severe metabolic disturbances and, and diffuse coagulopathy. The virus replicates in a lot of tissues. It causes multi-system involvement, systemic gastrointestinal symptoms, respiratory symptoms, uh, symptoms in the blood circulation, uh, and neurological symptoms as well. And this is because the virus is not only in a lot of places, but the immune response is massive. You have massive cytokine release, which causes, for example, a lot of the neurological symptoms as a consequence. Extensive necrosis of many organs replicates in a wide variety of cells. Amazingly broad tropism uh, destroys the liver and massive lymphocyte death. But the lymphocytes are not infected, so they're obviously c killed by uh, an immune process. And as I said, you make lots of um, inflammatory mediators. You get a, an imbalance of cytokine produc production, and this is in part responsible uh, for many of the symptoms. So in this African outbreak, the case fatality ratio ranged between 30 and 90 percent. Again, the number of people who die over the number of people with confirmed infection. And it was interesting, it went down during the outbreak as we learned how to take care of patients. So this need not be a fatal disease if you catch it early and if you treat the patients properly. So the lower end there reflects the fact that we, we could take care of them. And I think under ideal situations, you shouldn't have any fatality from this virus. Here in the US, we had one uh, from a, a, a person who came from West Africa and went to Dallas, and he was caught too late in the illness. So if you catch it early on, you know, with those early symptoms and diagnose it, it can be treatment. Uh, we don't know how many inapparent infections there are. We're still doing serological surveys that'll inform us about that. By all measures, Ebola is an acute infection, right? It comes, it's over in a certain period of time, you clear the infection. But after this massive outbreak in Africa, we found that the virus can persist in at least two sites in the body. And one of them was a report in the New England Journal uh, showing persistence of Ebola virus in ocular fluid. Um, and there were two physicians who came back to the US 
who got Ebola in Africa. They were, they were healed here. They were cured of infection. Uh, and then nine weeks after clearance of virus, so you're released when you have no more virus in your blood by PCR, they were released. And nine weeks later, these individuals developed eye problems. So here's a, uh, a view of the retina, and you can see these lesions here that they developed. They also developed calcification in the eye, and they found virus in the ocular fluid within the eyeball. So the fortunate part is that they're not shedding virus in tears. It's contained within the eyeball. But remember I told you that the eye is an immunoprivileged site, and so apparently the virus can get in and stay there for a long period of time. The relevance to this, of this to transmission isn't known. Another site we found uh, virus long after recovery is in semen. And this was, um, first of all, there was one good case where there seemed to be sexual transmission from a recovered male to a female in Africa. And then a study was done on men who had recovered from Ebola infection uh, in West Africa. 93 men, they looked for Ebola virus RNA by PCR. 46, almost half of the men um, at a long time after infection. You can see months since the onset of infection here. And the red is Ebola virus RNA detected out to nine months after infection. Uh, not in everyone, half of them, and some of them don't have it as well. Again, we don't know if this impl has implications for sexual transmission because they never got virus out of these individuals. It could be that the virus is actually not infectious and they're just pieces of genomes. But this is the kind of thing you see when you have a big outbreak, which is much bigger than anything you've seen before, and you can study people long term. So what have we learned from this? Well, as you may recall, a number of infections were exported to other countries. And so this is not simply an Africa problem. Uh, any infectious disease is a global problem. We actually had some vaccines ready to be tested, which they were tested in Africa, only because the US military had developed Ebola vaccines in the case of bioterrorism. Otherwise, no one wanted to develop an Ebola vaccine because there was no money to purchase it. And I visited a lab in the US that was working on this vaccine. Uh, the year before the Ebola outbreak, and they said to me, this will never get tested in people because there's no money. But of course, as soon as this outbreak occurred and it was threatening people globally, the money appeared uh, to test it. And that's why the vaccines are, had now been tested. Of course, the, the outbreak ended before they could really properly test the vaccines, so they're not yet approved. So presumably at the next outbreak, they can be rushed in immediately. This brings up a bigger question. What viruses do we prepare for? Who knows? Because you can't predict what the next one's going to be. You have to just be ready. You have to have the science ready so that you can make antivirals and vaccines. You have to invest in an infrastructure to do this. And we just don't do it. That's the problem. And especially here in the US, we view our own problems as ours and everyone else's as everyone else's. I was in Washington over the weekend. And um, someone said a congressman was giving a press conference, uh, Mikul Senator Mikulski from Maryland. Someone said, why aren't we spending more money on Zika? And she said, we won't spend money until it bites the Congress. And that's really it. Unless it's here, we don't care about it. So speaking of Zika, let's end with Zika virus. This is a virus identified in 1947 in Uganda, isolated from Aedes africanus, which is shown here was first isolated from people in 1954. So the 47 isolate was in a sentinel monkey that had been placed in the forest. They were looking for yellow fever virus, and this monkey got sick, and it turned out to have a new virus. It was serologically detected throughout Africa and Asia, uh, but there were no outbreaks. And over the next 50 years, until the late 90s, less than 20 cases identified in people. So this apparently benign virus is just simmering along. So it's a, mon it's a virus that's in monkeys, and somehow rarely it crossed into people. Uh, up until maybe five years ago, this was the situation in Africa. The red are seropositive, and the purple are where the virus has actually been detected. And in 2015, there was an outbreak in Cape Verde Islands, and it turns out a lot of Brazilians like to go there, and they brought it there uh, from Brazil. These are the countries in Asia that were positive. Again, the red serosurvey data, uh, and the purple isolation of virus. But again, until the late 90s, early 2000s, less than 20 human cases. There's a lot of seropositivity, so that means infections are going on, but apparently they're not associated with any disease or it's really, really mild. First outbreak, 2007, on Yap Island. 
that has a population of 7,000 people and quite a few of them became infected. And that was the first outbreak outside of, the first outbreak at all and the first infections outside of Africa and Asia. There was another outbreak in 2013, French Polynesia, 11% of the population, and then a variety of uh, outbreaks in the Pacific, uh, New Caledonia, Cook Islands, Easter Island, and, and uh, Samoa, Fiji, etc. So the, a picture of a slowly percolating uh, emerging virus, which was dormant for 50 years. So who knows why now it started spreading. It might have simply been in the right place uh, at the right time. So here's a, the situation in the Pacific. Here's Yap Island uh, on the upper left. And the arrows, by the way, indicate exportations, recent exportations from these islands elsewhere. It's only in the past five years or so that we have the technology to say uh, this person in Paris acquired the virus in some other place. And that's, so these are all recent uh, exportation uh, detections. Now in Brazil, the first cases were found in 2015, and these were caused by an Asian genotype. I'll tell you what that means in a, in a minute. And the introduction into Brazil correlates with an increase in air travel from areas where there was ongoing infection. Many people blame the World, the World Cup. It turns out that the countries that were seropositive for Zika weren't actually at the World Cup, so that wasn't it. But there are other events going on in Brazil which caused increased uh, people coming into the country, and we think that's what happened there. Supposedly, there will be 4 million cases by the end uh, of this year, and it's spread to uh, 52 other countries. So here's the situation uh, in the Western Hemisphere. The northern part of South America, you can see lots of infections. The virus is detected as well as Central America as well. And the range is pretty much in line with that of the vector. You know this is a Flavy virus. It is very much like uh, West Nile virus and yellow fever virus, dengue virus. It's an enveloped plus stranded RNA containing virus. The genome uh, is a, a single, has a single open reading frame that's translated into a polyprotein that's cleaved uh, by proteases. We don't know any of this for Zika. We just know it for the other Flavy viruses that have been studied. As soon as this hit the world scene at the end of 2015, which is about when people got interested in it, I can't tell you, I've never seen so many virologists start to work on a new virus, including us. And the structure of the particle was, was solved just a few weeks ago by Cryo-EM. It's just gorgeous. I made this image on my computer. You can see uh, there's a five-fold axis of symmetry. These are the E glycoproteins of the virus, which lay flat on the virus surface. Remember, these are the kinds of glycoproteins that are flat, and uh, upon acidification, they raise up and insert into the endosome membrane. You can see five-fold, uh, three-fold, and two-fold axes of symmetry. What's interesting here is that apparently the glycoproteins are assuming this icosahedral symmetry. It's not a capsid, right? There's, they're stuck in a membrane. And so how this happens is really curious. So here are phylogenetic trees of the two lineages. Here we have some of the other flavies, dengue and yellow fever and West Nile. You can see the Zika's cluster separately. So the numbers just tell you the relatedness in the sequence among the different isolates. So we have an Asian and an African lineage. The, li the lineage of Africa, of course, were the ones that spread throughout you know, Uganda, Nigeria, Senegal for many years. And the Asian, they have enough differences to be uh, put in a separate lineage. Now, as I, as I mentioned before, many people want to say that that difference, that sequence difference, is responsible for the spread of the virus, the increased pathogenicity, virulence, and so forth. But we have zero evidence that that's the case. Zero. It's a hypothesis which can't be proved because we can't infect people to figure that out. All we know is that the virus has differed upon introduction into Asia. I don't find that surprising at all because populations are different. And when you put a quasi-species into a new population, you select something that's better suited for that population. It may have nothing to do with the increased spread. It may just be that the virus was in the right place at the right time, found the right person who traveled, and then had a seronegative world in which to travel in. The vectors are 80s species of mosquitoes, in particular 80s aegypti and 80s albopictus. And in Africa, the reservoir is monkeys, but in other countries, it's humans. The virus can be spread from human to human by mosquitoes. This is the global range of Aedes aegypti and Aedes albopictus. So these are the areas where potentially we'll see the most uh, Zika infections. So I guess you should go to Canada or Australia and stay in the south of Australia. 
The uh, disease is typically a rash, fever, joint pain, conjunctivitis, headache, very similar to dengue and chick. So it could have been around for a while. We didn't detect it because it would look like dengue or chick, conjunctivitis, rash in different parts of the bodies. Incubation period, two to 10 days. And uh, only one in five develop symptoms. It's over in five days. So there can be a lot of spread asymptomatically because people are infected. They don't know it. They go out, they're bitten by mosquitoes, and rare fatalities. Viruses shed in semen, urine, saliva, blood, breast milk. Uh, we don't know how the virus gets to these sites with the exception of the blood. And we don't know what the consequence is for transmission of infection. The CDC claims seven sexually transmitted infections in the U.S. We have so far had 358 travel-related infections. These are people who come in the U.S. and they develop Zika. Um, and the sexually transmitted ones are six male to female, one male to male. In my view, they're not conclusive because transmission by close contact or saliva and urine has not been ruled out. The assumption is because virus uh, RNA can be found in semen that is sexually transmitted, but I don't think they've proven the case yet. Sexual transmission, if it's true, probably is not a major uh, source of transmission. It's the mosquito uh, that is transmitting this virus. So here are the cases of uh, Zika that have been imported in the US, 358, 31 in pregnant women. We don't know the outcomes of these pregnancies yet. M importantly, there are zero locally vector-acquired cases in the continental US. Uh, in the US territories, including Puerto Rico, Virgin Islands, and American Samoa, there have been 40, 471 locally acquired cases. So it's spreading uh, in those countries, person to person via mosquitoes. Puerto Rico is having a big outbreak at the moment. And of course, the question is whether it's going to spread to the US. And we don't know the answer, but here's some data that can help you decide. This is a map of mosquito abundance in the US. Uh, these circles show you the size of the circle is the number of people that come into this country from Zika endemic countries. So we have a lot of people coming into New York and Miami, Los Angeles, et cetera, that are coming from Zika infected countries. And then the colors show you in gray the 80s Egypti abundance in January, and the color is the 80s Egypti abundance in July. And so you can see that in New York, you know, we don't have any 80s Egypti in January, but uh, in July we have a moderate number of 80s Egypti. And the Egypti is the gray line. So it's a very southern mosquito. Albopictus is a little bit higher. You can see the dotted line here, and that's typical for that mosquito. Whether it spreads in the U.S. Uh, is anyone's guess. My guess, and it's purely a guess, is that it won't. Why? Because there's other viruses that have been here and have not spread. For example, dengue virus and chikungunya. Uh, dengue is a flavy chick, is a uh, alpha virus. Uh, they are vectored by 80 species, uh, but they have not spread locally in the U.S. There have been two small outbreaks in Florida and Texas where you have the most mosquito activity year-round. These viruses have not spread. Now, you may say, you know, yellow fever spread to Philadelphia, which is a flavy vectored by 80s Egypti in 1793, but it's a different world now. We have screens on our windows. We have air conditioning. Uh, I think our population density isn't anywhere near like that of Brazil, for example, where there are no screens on many of the windows in the Northeast Partian. I think it's not likely to spread uh, here in the U.S. Now, you may also say, well, the West Nile spread, didn't it? Well, yeah, it did, but different mosquito, Culex, which is way nor more northern than 80s. And what's the other reason why West Nile spread in the US? Bird reservoir, exactly. The, the Zika doesn't have a bird reservoir. As far as I know, there are no wild monkeys in the US, so it's only people. And I don't think we have the right conditions for spread. Uh, last week, the CDC wrote an article in the New England Journal uh, where they concluded, uh, they reviewed all the data, they concluded that there's a relationship between prenatal Zika infection and microcephaly. There's also evidence that the virus can get into the central nervous system. It can cause uh, Guillain-Barre, which is a peripheral in, uh, myelitis caused by an autoimmune disease. There's one report of uh, acute myelitis virus in the cerebral spinal fluid, and one report of uh, meningoencephalitis virus also in the cerebral spinal fluid. But these are very rare occasions, and so I think the main uh, concern, of course, is microcephaly. How common does all of this happen? I think what you should get from this is that host species jumps of viruses are pretty rare, but when they are successful, they can cause a number of problems, and it's hard for us to predict them. We cannot say what's the next virus going to be. No one would have 
predicted that Zika would be spreading globally, although a few people had an idea. But my advice is we should be ready. We should have a great scientific research establishment that understands all the viruses out there. And you know, the, any new virus that emerges is not going to be a brand new family. It's going to be a Flavy or a Picorna or a Paramyxovirus. So if we know how to make vaccines and antivirals, and if we know how to adapt to a new emerging virus, we'll be okay. And that's one of the reasons I teach this course, to get you excited about viruses. So some of you will go on and work on them, and you can be ready uh, for the next Zika virus.